May the grace of our Lord God be with you all this blessed Sunday. Brethren, we have been greatly blessed and are privileged in Christ, and we ought to be thankful for His filling and enhancing of our spiritual well-being despite the many trials today. This morning, as we begin our worship and sing our songs of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord, please join me as we read together Revelations chapter 5, verses 12 to 13 where the angels continually praise the Lord, saying, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. And I heard every created thing which is in heaven or on the earth or under the earth or on the sea and all the things in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be the blessing, the honor, the glory, and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Dear brethren, even while we are still here on this earth, it is already an honor and a blessing to be able to worship Him freely, knowing one day, just like the angels, we will be able to come face to face with our Lord and worship Him forever. Please bow down your heads with me as we open in prayer. Our almighty and loving Father, we praise you and glorify your name today. O Lord, we acknowledge that apart from you, we are nothing and that you alone are worthy and most deserving of all our praises. Lord God, we ask that you examine our hearts and you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may come to a better understanding of who you are and your will for each of us. Lord, as we praise you this morning, may you touch the lives of everyone listening right now, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. This we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Oh Lord, you alone are worthy. And we just bless your name today. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you
join me in our meditation as we continue in the spirit and attitude of worship today. Our message is titled as Salvation, Our Greatest Hope, Joy, and Confidence. This message was inspired by truths from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 13. Let's read our passage first before we pray. God's word says, beginning in verse 10, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Join me in prayer. Let us pray. God, our Father, we yield our whole being to you today, heart, mind, soul, and strength, so that you might once again fill us with the glory of your truth. Help us to see you and your amazing work in our redemption through Christ by the Holy Spirit so we can continue to appreciate you and deepen the roots of our gratitude and worship of you, O Lord. May your truth lift our hearts today from doubts and discouragement due to the difficulties brought about by the prevailing crisis we face and even from our own weaknesses in the flesh. We thank you for hearing this prayer as we ask them in Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, the year 2020 is almost over. At this time of the year, our hearts ought to be filled with the spirit of thanksgiving and praises to our Heavenly Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. Some of us might say, but that might be quite a challenge to do, Pastor, because we all know that the greater part of this year were spent in living through the threats and tragedies brought about by COVID-19. The latest reports had claimed over 1.5 million deaths worldwide and hundreds of thousands had been and are currently infected by this virus. Some among us had lost loved ones and friends this year. Many businesses either were downsized or stopped operating altogether. And countless lost their jobs and means of daily subsistence. The normal functions and routine of life were significantly interrupted. The year 2020 is undeniably a stressful year and we followers of Christ are not spared from these distresses. Through all of these, 2020 is a year that made us to realize that we can lose not just our dear life and material possessions, but the threat of losing our hopes, our joy within, and our confidence to be in God's calling amidst the harsh realities of life has become more and more pronounced for the most part of this year. Such were the experiences of the intended recipients of God's word through the Apostle Peter's letter in 1 Peter. These Christians were enduring terrible afflictions and persecutions while living in a predominantly 
pagan society. Several of them died in martyrdom for their faith. Some were stressed in their homes from pagan spouses, in their jobs from pagan employers, and in their communities from pagan influences. In that environment, it is so easy to succumb to doubts regarding the faith. Some wondering why they were suffering for their commitment to the cause of Christ. Asking, is it worth all the pain I am going through? Brethren, please don't get me wrong. My goal for this message is not to burden your heart with more description of our difficulties. But my goal with prayer to our Lord is that we will become aware of Peter's encouragement by the help of the Holy Spirit to get his readers to look away from their sufferings and to focus their attention on the greatness of their salvation. In reference to the threats and challenging experiences we went through this year, permit me to provoke your thoughts with this question. What is truly your greatest and only source of hope, joy, and confidence in this life and the next? Now, some might answer, my family. Some may say, my friendships. I wonder if some may answer that it is their job or their businesses or profession. Or could any of us say, my achievements in terms of my travel experiences or my possessions or monetary accumulations are my greatest source of hope, of joy, and confidence in this life and for the next. God's word in 1 Peter wants us to realize that Salvation in Christ is the greatest source of our hope, our joy, and our confidence in the face of the troubles and uncertainties of this life. God, through Peter, wants us to be clear that there is a far greater reality than our sufferings in this life. And that is our salvation in Christ, which has no rival in worth by comparison. If you are someone still in doubt about the surpassing worth of our salvation, let me assert that God shows through the letter of First Peter how the grace of salvation is the greatest anyone can be blessed with. Salvation in Christ is the greatest truth in the face of our mortality and temporality in this life. I say this with great surety because it is founded on the flow of thought of God's Word leading to our passage. If you have your Bibles opened in 1 Peter chapter 1, let me point out to you this flow of thought in God's mind. In verses 3 to 5 of chapter 1, if you would care to note, Peter points his readers to the greatness and certainty of their present and future inheritance. Did you see that? In verses 6 to 9, Peter shows how this great salvation results in inexpressible joy even in the midst of ongoing trials. And in our passage today, in verses 10 to 12, Peter goes back to the past prophetic revelations about this great salvation to show how unfathomable the riches of salvation in Christ is that neither the prophets nor the angels fully grasped it, but they trusted God. How privileged we are 
who had received it, brethren. God, through the Apostle Peter, meant to encourage believers in the midst of the harsh realities of being faithful to Christ in a sinful and stressful world. God encourages us to go through the pains and the difficulties of our faith, just as Christ first suffered and then was glorified. So too can we go through sufferings with confidence that there is glory during this life and the hereafter. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to study and meditate with me on the reasons why salvation is our greatest hope, joy, and confidence in this life and the next. The first in our passage is, our salvation is God's grace working in us. And we see that in verse 10 and in verse 13. Let me read for you. In verse 10, it says, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. And in verse 13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the Apostle Peter, guided by the Holy Spirit, uses the word grace in chapter 1, verse 10, and in chapter 1, verse 13, as a synonym for the salvation which we have received. Now, allow me to point out that there are three tenses of our salvation. We were saved from sin's penalty when we put our faith in Christ. We are being saved from sin's power as we walk by faith in our new life in Christ. And ultimately, we shall be saved from sin's presence as we persevere by faith. I want to dwell on the word grace, for it is an important word here in our passage. Peter used it ten times in this letter in 1 Peter. Grace, as many of us already know, is undeserved favor from God. Now, applying this to my experience, in the 37 years after receiving salvation, I have lived a relatively clean life since. But as a young Christian back then, I had no depth of understanding with regards to how sinful my heart really was in my being suspicious, my being emotionally bitter when deeply offended, being selfish, worldly, and materialistic. I catch myself not being forthright at times, excusing myself rather than owning up to my own mistakes. And there were several times I failed to trust God. Worse, I doubted Him on certain situations. But, brethren, I would like to point out why were I being sensitive to this subtle sense now in my heart? I believe it is because of the work of grace. Salvation has brought that grace that makes us sensitive to things that are not right and not pleasing before the Lord. And I've learned that, that as I submitted to Christ, the more I see how desperately sinful I am in my heart because of the grace of God through the Holy Spirit, which makes me cling to Christ more closely and depend on God's grace more. 
I had to learn that grace is God's ongoing mercy and kindness because of the intercessions of Christ and His enabling power in me by the Holy Spirit. It was then that I truly understood how completely God's grace is that I grew to appreciate Him, love Him much, and is now serving Him because of the wonder of His grace. That gives me hope despite my struggles with my own sin. And that's sustaining grace. The more we see our own sinfulness, the more precious, captivating, and amazing God's grace appear to us. Let me add that we should not confuse grace for a carefree, laid-back type of Christianity that urges us not to be too hard on ourselves and not to be demanding of others. We end up being tolerant of all sorts of sin that the Bible strongly censures. God's word in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 tells us that we should fix our hope completely on God's grace and not just for the present but also for the future. When Christ returns to bring us with him into eternity, listen to the verse. It says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, brethren, did you notice that there is grace for now that God has given to us to help us? There is that working of grace right now in the present and there will be grace that Christ will bring about when he returns that will transform us. And then he tells us immediately to be set apart and pure before God. And we find this in verses 14 and 15. Listen as I read for you. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Let us not miss, brethren, a key point about God's grace. God's glorious grace is what truly transforms us into Christ-likeness and will carry us through whatever challenges we face. As John Piper said, grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned. Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. And if I may continue, let me state that God's grace also gives me joy in the fact that God is working on me to refine me in my spiritual walk. That is what I call sanctifying grace. Next, let's look at the encouraging words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This gives me confidence, brethren, because I know that God's work of grace will carry on till the day of Christ. That's what our passage 
tells us. This work of grace will continue on until the day of Christ. And that for me is sufficient grace. Now brethren, pray tell me if there is a place where we can buy grace, the grace of God, or a shop where we can have grace applied to us. Grace is God's work because of salvation in Christ. The second reason why salvation in Christ is our greatest hope, joy, and confidence in this life and the next is our salvation is God's pattern for life as the prophets predicted. And we see this in verses 10 and 11. Let me read. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Now, God is telling us through Peter that the salvation you and I have received is the very thing that these great men of God spent their lives searching to understand who the promised Messiah might be and the timing of his great sufferings and the ensuing glories to follow. Note on the two details of what the ancient prophets were carefully searching, inquiring and seeking to know as God himself predicted to them accord, according to verse 11. Did you notice that, brethren? God revealed to them and to us two important details about Christ's work in our salvation, namely Christ's suffering and Christ's glorification. Now, what is the significance of these two details given to us here in verse 11? I believe they represent the two details in God's pattern of life for us, okay? God's pattern of life for us who are disciples or followers of Christ. They are sufferings with and for Christ for sanctification and the other one is glorification. As we transform to be like Christ, Jesus himself emphasized the same pattern, cross-bearing before the crown. Asking a rhetorical question in Luke 24, verse 26, where he said, Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? As someone has said, there is no crown before the cross, no resurrection before crucifixion, and no glory before shame. Let me point out, brethren, that this verse is the first reference in this epistle to the sufferings of Christ. As Peter seeks to encourage these Christians to be faithful in the face of their suffering, he repeatedly reminds them of the consistent examples of Christ that we find here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, chapter 1, verse 21, and then chapter 2, verse 4, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, and verse 21 to verse 24. And we have references of this in chapter 3, verse 18, chapter 4, verse 1, verse 13, and chapter 5, verse 1. In application, are we following the pattern of life Christ has modeled for us, brothers and sisters? Do we bear the cross of shame and persecution as we share and articulate our faith? among friends, workmates, 
and loved ones despite their adverse reaction as we share Christ? Do we crucify the flesh in the face of temptations by the lust of the flesh and the allure of the world and Satan? If you and I are true followers of Christ, there is no other way to live but to suffer with Christ. Jesus, as he summoned the crowd with his disciples, said to them in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, let me read for you. He said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 16 to 17, it also says, the Spirit himself tes testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Christ, so that we may also be glorified with Christ. Our salvation in Christ reveals the only pattern, brethren, the only pattern that God designed, or maybe I should say designated for our lifestyle. And there is no other pattern that God has designed for us, most especially us who have been called into Christ. It is the pattern of, notice the sequence, suffering and glorification. I would like to note that the saga of mankind in the narratives of the Bible and the current lifestyles happening around us as well as those we hear and see in the daily news is proof that describes humanity plagued with selfishness and sinfulness. And the perils of disregarding the divinely initiated, preserving and redeeming influence of the life of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question, brethren. In the spiritual pandemic that infected all of us, what is the only solution and way of life that will prevent all present and future contamination? In this pandemic of sin that has infected us, what do you think will prevent? the present and future contamination of this infection of sin on mankind? The answer is the Christ life. That's the only answer we can get and we can give. The cure for man's sinfulness is salvation in Christ that brings the prospect, the possibility of the Christ life. And when the life of Christ is living in us, and as we allow the life of Christ to live from within us, through us, then the words of Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 will become true in our lives. Allow me to read for you Ephesians 5, 25, the second part, to verse 27. It says here, Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And if we will move on to Titus chapter 2, verse 14, it also asserts the preserving and redeeming influence of Jesus Christ by stating, and I read, 
who gave himself for us to redeem from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Someone has said, no single influence has had so great an impact on this earth as the life of Jesus Christ. The glories of Christ refer to his resurrection, his ascension, his present exalted place at the right hand of the Father. The glories of Christ anticipates his bodily return and his future reign in power and glory. Our salvation is great because it is centered on these most crucial truths in history past and in history future. And salvation allows us to become partakers of the glories of Christ, more especially the glories of Christ foretold for the future brethren. The third reason why salvation in Christ is our greatest hope, joy, and confidence in this life and the next is our salvation is God's personal revelation to us. And let me bring you to verse 12. It says here, verse 12 says, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Now note in verse 12, God's word through Peter says that the prophets receive instructions directly from God. Did you notice that? The revelation being given them about salvation in Christ were not for themselves according to the verse. It was not just for themselves only but for the salvation of others who are called to be redeemed. After the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This direct personal revelation of God to the writers of scripture is called divine inspiration. The Bible scholar Charles Caldwell Ryrie said in his book, Bible Doctrines, by Moody Bible Institute, and I quote for you. He said, God superintended the human authors of Scripture so that using their own personalities, they composed and recorded without error his message. The Apostle Peter explains this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, when he wrote, no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, some of you might be saying, that's all good, Pastor, but that's all theology stuff. How do you make sense of this, Pastor, in practical ways? How do you make sense of this truth in practical ways? Well, let me tell you this, okay? You want to be practical about all these truths that First Peter is saying to us in this portion. Let me say to you, the Bible in 66 books, though written by 40 authors over a period of, listen, 1,500 years. Think about that. 66 books, 40 different authors, and many of them, they did not know each other, and they wrote over a 
over a period of 1,500 years. And despite that, the Bible has a unity and integrity that is not possible apart from supernatural influence of God. Now, you might be asking as well, what is that unity, Pastor? Now, let me tell you, it is the story of God's salvation in Christ from cover to cover. That's the unifying point of Scripture, okay? Written over that long period of time by 40 authors, in 66 writings and they were all talking about one person our lord jesus christ and jesus points this out to these two men these two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus when he joined them in Luke chapter 24, verse 27. Let me read for you. It says, Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all scriptures. Now, if you're still asking, how do you make sense of these truths in a practical way, Pastor? Well, let me tell you this. In our passage, in verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 1, there is a repeated word that occurs once in chapter 1 verse 10 and three times in chapter 1 verse 12, which drives home Peter's message. It is the word you. Okay? And I hope you see that on the slide. Okay? I marked that and highlighted that word. The word you. He writes of the grace that would come to you in verse 10. And Peter said, they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The point is simple. The reason why the message of salvation in Christ made sense to you is because God made it a personal message to you and to me, brethren. Is that practical now, brethren? That's what the Word of God is saying. Our salvation has been made possible because because we receive a direct and personal revelation from none other than God himself. And that should make us say, Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. Salvation is because of direct and personal message by the Lord to you and me. You know, the third reason why salvation in Christ is our greatest hope and joy and confidence in this life and the next is because the greatest message in human history and in the history of world, the seen and the unseen realm did not happen by random chance, but by direct announcement by God into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus pointed this out to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. You remember that? When Jesus told Peter, after Peter making that confession of who Jesus is. You remember in Matthew 16, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? That was the question of Jesus. And Peter replied, do you remember? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. To which Jesus replied back and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. 
Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, deep inside of us, we know that we know it was God in Christ who revealed and continues to reveal himself to us by illuminating the written word as we read it. So it turns into the living word. It turns into the bread of life. It becomes sweeter than honey. It becomes the living water that quenches the thirsting of our soul. So we never thirst again. The written word becomes the personal word of comfort, of guidance, of teaching and correction to us from God, directly from God himself. Brethren, there is no other source of hope eternal or joy unspeakable and confidence that will never be shaken like the voice of Christ. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow. And, and brothers and sisters, this is not Google Voice or Siri or Alexa. Okay? I'm afraid that nowadays we hear more of the voice of Google and Siri rather than the voice of God. Brethren, and this is why our salvation is that great, brethren. Because the God of our salvation through Christ by the Holy Spirit has given us a direct line of communication with Him. Amen? And as I go to the fourth and last point here in our passage, the reason why salvation in Christ is our greatest hope, joy, and confidence in this life. And the next is because our salvation is God's work attractive even to the angels. Note in verse 12, the third part. Let me just read the whole of verse 12 so that we can get the whole context here. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And here it is now. What are those announced? Peter said, these are things into which angels long to look. In the last part of verse 12, note that God's word here through the apostle Peter says that even the angels long to look into our salvation. Now the word look in the original means to bend forward, to look more Closely. It was the same word used of Peter bending forward to look into the tomb, into that empty tomb in John chapter 20, verse 5. The word also means gazing intently at something, as in James chapter 1, verse 25, which says, But one who looks intently, that's the same word, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And it carries, that word carries the idea of looking with intense interest. If we speculate, brothers and sisters, if we just speculate on the possible reasons why angels are so attracted to our salvation, 
Perhaps one of the reasons could be that God did not provide salvation for angels when they fell with Lucifer in Isaiah 14. God provided salvation only for fallen human beings and at great cost. God the Son took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and died in our place on the cross. God's plan is that His manifold wisdom might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. And that's why the angels are interested. They long to look and see and appreciate. Now, brothers and sisters, whatever steered the intense interest of angels, we can assume that they know a lot about God. We can assume that because why? They can stand in His holy presence according to Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 3. They are also sent out to do His will. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, it tells us that. And they have tremendous authority and power. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 11 intimates us this and Jude verses 8 and 9. But my point here is that angels being impressive and powerful beings as they are and being sinless at the same time and, and obedient as they are and yet there is something about the majesty of God's character and wisdom in our salvation that angels are fascinated, that angels long to look and long to see. That alone, brethren, the implication of that, okay, these mighty creatures, this powerful being, in the heavenlies, sinless and pure at that. If they long to see the details of our salvation, then that implies how privileged we are to enjoy such a great salvation which is not available to angels. Brethren, how privileged we are to enjoy such a great salvation. Can you tell that to the person beside you? Brethren? Can you say, how privileged are we to have been given salvation? You know, in Hebrews it says there, what is man that thou art so mindful of him? And friends, think about that with me for a few moments. If you are someone who do not appreciate your salvation that well, if you are someone who believe you are saved, but you are not really excited about your salvation, think about these thoughts that we are meditating upon. Amen. It compels us to ask, brethren, if this powerful and pure servants of the Almighty and Holy God are gripped with interest regarding God's salvation in Christ, how about we sinners saved by grace? Are we gripped with the same degree of enthusiasm with regards to our own salvation in Christ? Brothers and sisters, are you studying details about your salvation, our salvation? Are we learning to be proficient 
regarding the details of our salvation, the wonder and the amazing truths of our salvation to such that we are able to share it with excitement to others who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior. Will we be able to handle the message of salvation in such that we create enthusiasm as we are being helped by the Holy Spirit in the spirit and in the hearts of those who are listening to us when we share the gospel right then? Those are the implications for us regarding the greatness of our salvation. It should be the source of our greatest hope and joy and confidence in this life and the next. And for my closing thoughts, one of the main points I began this message with is asking the question, what is truly your greatest and only source of hope, joy, and confidence in this life and the next? It is a personal question with both temporal and eternal implications. If your honest answer to this question is anything other than Jesus Christ and the salvation he has given to me by grace through faith, if your honest answer to that question is anything than that, okay, it is on your slide. Let me repeat that again. The answer is Jesus Christ and the salvation he has given to me by grace through faith. If that is not your answer, take all of what we studied and meditated upon today into serious consideration and do some serious soul searching. You may be a religious person, a church member, or even involved in Christian ministry. But if you've never responded personally to the great salvation God provided in Jesus Christ, you are lost. Let me say that with all concern and all love. And that is why at this point, let me give an invitation to you. Okay. If you were not able to answer that question correctly with the right answer, I invite you to receive Christ right now. Recognize Him as your Lord and Savior. How do you do that? You may ask. Well, first admit that you are a sinner. We are all sinners because of the inherited sinful nature from our first parents, Adam and Eve. That's why we have a natural propensity to commit sin. Notice that it is so natural for us to commit sin rather than to do what is right and to do what is good in the eyes of God. Why? Because we have a sinful nature, thereby making us sinners. If you admit that you are a sinner before the Lord, and if you ask forgiveness for your sins right now in your heart, and if you will recognize Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, surrendering your life to him right now to make him Lord of your life from here on, from this time on, then salvation is yours. Would you like to do that in a formal gesture through prayer? If you do, then bow down with me and let's pray. Bow down with me and pray with me this prayer. Pray with me, follow with me, and make it a prayer from your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I admit before you, I am a sinner. And Lord, I cannot save myself by my own efforts and by my own goodness. Lord Jesus, I come to you 
and I ask forgiveness for all my sins, and I recognize your finished work at Calvary to pay for all my sins. I receive you, Lord. I recognize you as my Savior. And from this day on, I surrender my whole being to you. Be Lord of my life, Lord. Continue to reveal yourself to me and reveal your truth to me, Lord, so that I may follow you and obey. Thank you. This is my faith and prayer. Amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer, you have received eternal life in Christ Jesus. If you prayed from the heart, if you repented of your sin and recognized Christ, the Bible says that you have received eternal life. And you will know in the days to come the evidences if you really have eternal life. It would be an exciting time to find out. Amen? Now, let me just continue so that we can finish this morning. Okay? Let me turn now. For those of you who believe, okay, that you have submitted yourselves to Christ, let me say this. In all love and concern, I fear that for many of us, who call ourselves believers or born-again Christians. Salvation is good for many of us, but not really the greatest in this life. And particularly in the face of the reality of death, it adds a little fulfillment to our normal life. I mean salvation. For many of us, I'm afraid that we look at salvation and we consider it as something that adds something to our normal lives. But I fear that our answer to the question, what is our greatest source of hope, of joy, and confidence in this life and the next, I fear the answer might be salvation in Christ. But, it is not essentially the core of our life. Without which, we would miss the main purpose for our being called into Christ. Brethren. If salvation is not the greatest, then, brothers and sisters, meditate on these things that we have looked at and studied this morning. Go back to this. You can repeat our message. You have that privilege and that capability. And look into it more closely. Why? Let me say as I end. The year 2020 will soon be over. But let me tell you, the difficulties and the troubles and the temptations in life will not be over with 2020. Because the pandemic of sin will continue with us, not just till next year, but till Christ returns. But the good news is, we, the redeemed in Christ, can face them triumphantly because of the greatness of God's grace in giving us a salvation the prophets diligently studied and predicted, of which the Holy Spirit inspired messengers preach, and the angels continues to investigate with amazement. We should be confidently enduring, come what may with hope and joy and confidence because of our salvation in Christ. And so in conclusion and challenge, dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, to the question, what is truly your greatest and only source of hope, joy, and confidence in this life and the next? Our bold reply is, our salvation in Christ 
by grace through faith because our salvation is God's working in us. God's grace working in us. It is God's pattern for life he has given us and he has prescribed to us. It is God's personal revelation to us and it is God's majesty of which even the angels look on with amazement. And what is that? Our salvation. That is our greatest source of hope, of joy, and confidence. And so with that, let's close in prayer. Our gracious and merciful God and Father, we overflow with gratitude and worship to you because of the greatness of your salvation, which you freely gave to us in Christ by the Holy Spirit. May the implications of your truths you made alive to us today enable us to continue with undying hope, unquenchable joy, and exuding confidence to face life's challenges and difficulties with faith and to overcome the lust of the flesh, the temptations of the world, and the deceitfulness of spirit, our spiritual enemies. O oh Lord, deepen our personal experiencing of your presence and use us to lead others to your salvation in Christ that we all might be for your praise and glory and honor always. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this. Amen. Amen. Let me give you the final benediction. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. May God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Before we go, allow me to give you in some instruction on an upcoming event. This is our annual Thanksgiving celebration that we hold every end of the year. And most especially those of you who are part of our ministry. Let's prepare ourselves, let's prepare our hearts to come together in the available means possible for us where we could be all safe, most especially from the threat of this virus. And uh, we could be safe from the possible encumbrances that might come about. So let me just give you instruction and appeal to you regarding two questionnaires on our slides and we put them on the slides and I pray that you are seeing it now on the screen and notice brothers and sisters in Christ we would like to invite you to join our online stream of our annual Thanksgiving celebration which will be on December 27, 2020. And that is a Sunday, and call time is call time online is 8:30 in the morning. Let me take the opportunity to request you to answer in simple statements your personal experiences this current year with Christ in the two questions shown on the screen right now. And can you answer those two questions in simple statements? You can answer in Visayan or Tagalog 
or in English. Yeah. Give us a few statements of your personal experiences in relation to those two questions. Yeah. And you may send them to us through our Facebook page or you can write them down on the comment page of our Facebook page or in our YouTube channel. Thank you for your response. We would truly appreciate them. Once again, may the Lord continue to bless this week in your life. May you continue to experience Him, especially as we come to the close of this year and we will be together again next Sunday. Worthy is